All right, thank you, Justin. As you see, cars are on track. As Ralph mentioned, this is Group 8A, 1981 to 91 IMSA GT prototypes. That's a stunner right there. The Coca Cola 962 livery car. There's a Michelin starting grid for you. Our mother's polishes and waxes helping to bring it to you. List of the names of the drivers. Entered into this event here this afternoon, the final one of the day. What a way to finish it off, too. Yeah, there's a lot of my personal broadcasting history out there. Yes, absolutely. There's a beautiful Group 44 Jaguar, the Mazda prototype. There's Bruce Canapa's. 962 we were talking about yeah he and uh, justin spoke about you know how hard it is to uh to bring these cars up to current spec in terms of technology and safety and so forth one of the things that really jumps out at me is where do you find the decals to make these cars look just as they did back in the day you have to have them made right you have to have them custom made yep use a lot of the archive photography that's out there all the different angles mm -hmm. I really think that's what speaks to people as much as anything else is the liveries on these cars. That well, Coca-Cola 962 is another great example. Let's let the engine speak for now. Here we go, getting ready to go green. Final race of the day. How about that front row? All Japanese, Toyota versus Mazda. And how about the sound of that rotary? There's Bruce Canepa, who's already made up a couple of spots as he goes around the outside of the Andretti corner. That was close. Well, I thought the Repsol car was going to get into him there. Look at the oh, oh man. there may was have been there contact. contact there. There may have been with Lee Giannone's Porsche 962. Jonathan Bomarito in the factory Mazda, the orange and green car. Here comes Bruce up the inside of one of the other Toyotas. Yeah, that 99 is. Charlie Nierberg's. Now, Nierberg's actually at the front of the field. That's oh, he's the other the 99. The yeah, there's, oh, there's actually two of the AAR cars Perfect. running here today. Yeah, Dominic Dobson's in the other one. Yeah. Boy, the battle here, too. Canepa's got his hands full here. So one of those BF Goodrich 962s. Yeah. Jim Busby campaigned a two-car team. Some of the greatest sports car drivers in history many years in IMSA's Camel GT Series. Here's Ganapa slicing down the inside. He's had so many laps around this place in so many different cars. Of course, we saw him earlier in the day winning in his 935, but he knows he can run with Nierberg and his Toyota up there if he can catch him. There he is. He's up to third. The third at one lap. He's got to deal with Bomarito in the Mazda. Jonathan Bomarito, another local product, one of the factory Mazda drivers in the current IMSA WeatherTech series. We talked earlier about how they forged a new alliance with Yoast Racing, arguably one of the greatest endurance racing sports car teams of all time. So we'll see where that program goes. Here's the number 68. Wade Carter in that 84 Porsche 962. Oh, there goes Bruce. He's got second. Yep. He's also got, looks like the right side tail light falling off the bodywork. Maybe that's some of that contact. Contact is not appreciated. They just finished this car. It's the first time it's been on the racetrack. And as he mentioned, they had an issue earlier in the day with a sensor. And there's your race leader, the 99 of Charles Nierberg. It's a Mark III GTB. The other 99, yeah. Dominic Dobson driving, is a Mark II. Right. This car here, Bob, well, that's the one that you really want. Out of all the Toyota Eagles that are out there, that's the car that Juan Fangio the second mm -hmm. and PJ Jones had so much incredible success with that car that's the car that basically 
ruined it for everybody, if you will, because it was so dominant, so incredibly quick. Held outright track records all over the country. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, the record at Daytona still stands to this day. I wouldn't be surprised. They used to hold the track record here, broken only by a couple of state-of-the-art Formula One cars since, I guess, around 2007 or so. Yeah, yeah, look at that taillight flapping at the back of uh, the car there. That's Canapa's Porsche. You heard uh, Bruce talking about driving these cars. We were chatting this morning in the paddock, and he said, at slow speeds, the 962 is very easy to drive. The bodywork does such a great job with the arrow and everything as we watch a pair of them here. He said, you get them up to nine tenths, 10 tenths, really start hustling the car and it becomes a pretty wicked beast and you better have your hands wrapped around it as tight as you can because they can be a handful when you're really running them hard. Tom Dooley being chased by Lee Giannone. But that's also why they were such a great customer car, right? Right. Because you put, put that car in the hands of somebody who really knew what they were doing, like a Derek Bell, for example, and uh, sure, they can run that car at the limit and still masterfully coax it to the checkered flag. But sure. so many of the other uh, privateers could get in the car, run it at their top speed, but maybe not everything it was capable of. Yeah, it was definitely the car to have for a number of years in GTP competition. Then came the great Nissans, Trevor Harris, took Jeff Brabham to four straight championships. Then along came these guys, Dan Gurney's All-American Racers, reading the rule book carefully and coming up with this 2.1 liter inline four. I asked Dan once, what kind of turbocharger do you have on that thing? It's so quick. He said, a big one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in, in talking to Charlie, the gentleman driving this car, he said, you know, Big credit to Dan Gurney and his guys at All-American Racers. When he got the car, he actually bought the car away from Juan. And Juan was gifted the car from Toyota and Dan Gurney after winning the championship of the car. He sold it to Charlie. And it was Gurney and his guys who really did a great job in, in giving him a lot of the setup tips and information and help with pieces and parts to get it to the place now where he can get out here and truly enjoy it and win with it like he's doing here today. Yep. John Ward was the designer. Incredibly innovative operation as All-American Racers and is to this day. As you see Canapa, you saw the gap that he has to try to catch near Burke. Yeah, it's about five seconds. Great looking car. Juan Fangio the second, by the way, is the nephew of the five-time Formula One world champion known as the Maestro. Well, he's got that taillight dragon, but the good news is he's got the right guys to fix it when he gets it back to the shop at Scotts right. Valley. That's right. Fix it, guys. I think it'll be spotless by Tuesday. Now, the Mazda that... Uh, Bomberino's driving has reeled him right back in. Maybe uh, Bruce is figuring, well, I'm not going to be able to catch him, so let's go to Justin. Tell you what, Bruce's car is actually misfiring as it comes down the front straight, and I know that must be incredibly infuriating for him, especially as he's the one that was prepping it. He's coming on through turn 11 right now. The Mazda behind, absolutely a sitting duck, has. Bomarito heads off the straight, but the number 14 is, is as you can tell, a lamed up right now there, Ralph. Uh, but the one thing about 962, and we were talking about it in that little interview, it's a sublime car to drive. The way the turbos spool up, the way it lays down power, the downforce, it really was a magnificent machine in the time. And it does give you respect for how the Porsche factory could run those cars for 24 hours uh, without many problems. It was like a Titanic machine. Maybe the wrong word, Titanic. But you get my feeling. Yes, indeed. My old broadcast partner, David Hobbs, used to marvel at the Porsche 962. As he said, you'd fire it up at the beginning of the race and it would go brruh, 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 brruh. You'd thrash it for 24 hours, pull into the pits, it would go brruh, 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 brruh. 
ready to go another 24 hours. Bulletproof. Bob, this was one of my favorite race cars of all time right here. Mm -hmm. The Group 44 Jaguar XJR5. Went on to the 6 and the 10 and the 12. There's a whole group of them after this car. But this one, to me, I think was the most spectacular. Design. Absolutely beautiful. With that incredible 12-cylinder engine. Just one of the most. I mean, it's, it's rare that a car looks as good without its body work as it does with it on. With that incredible engine in this car. I could just look at it all day. It was interesting when I was over at Goodwood back in June. Uh, there was another one over there competing. And I was talking to the owner of the car. Oh, Cannabis called it a day. Anyway, I, I said, you know, I've always loved a car. We were talking about it a little bit. He goes, yeah, he goes, you know, when I bought it and I brought it over here, he said some of the English Jaguar racing fans aren't as happy with that car. I said, really, why not? He says, because it's an American Jaguar to them. Because <laughs> it was the Tullius operation yeah. out of right. South Florida. Right. Immaculate. The crew always in gleaming white uniforms. And the drivers who went through this operation, I mean, in addition to Bob Tullius who did some driving, Brian Redman and David Hobbs and Hurley Haywood and Chip Robinson and Bill Adam, and the list goes on and on and on as we get back to our leader. Well, if the Jaguar XJR5 was the most beautiful car of this era, if the Porsche 962 was the most successful as far as race wins, there might not have been one more dominant in this era than this car. Absolutely. Winner 21 times out of 27 races. Back-to-back -back IMSA championships. And one of the differences between this car and the other one you were talking about, the Mark II, and talking with Charles Nierberg about it, this one more of a slab side right. down the length of the car. Yeah, the other one was more swoopy. Swoopy. Yeah, that's a good word for it. Sensuous. I, I actually prefer the other design, but you know, if Dan Gurney says this is the preferred way to go aerodynamically, who am I to question it? Here goes Bomberito again. This Mazda here ran five Group C World Endurance races in 89 and in the IMSA GTP category. Finished eighth at Le Mans. Right. This is the livery of the Charge clothing line that was on in 1991 when the Mazda 787B won Le Mans. To this point, the only... Japanese mark to win overall at Le Mans. I called that race. Volker Biedler, Bertrand Gasho, Johnny Herbert drove the car. That is not this car, but that was the sponsorship and livery that it raced under. Herbert disposing of the Group 44 Jag. Nice little belch of flame out the back. Efficient cars ever to take to the racetrack. But boy, were they fun to watch. The speed out of this car at the hands of Juan Manuel Fangio II and PJ Jones was just, man, it was breathtaking to watch them behind the wheel with these cars. A combination of many years of collaboration between all American racers and Toyota. They went through the the GT ranks, GTU, and the larger displacement, GTO cars winning championships and lots and lots of races in the series of Toyota Eagles. And then on into champ car racing for some years before they parted ways. Catching up to the Coca Cola 962. The second IMSA Porsche 962 102, built by the Porsche factory in 84. Bob Aiken Motorsports, racing in the 85 GTP season. Yep, the one Sebring one year on Stuck, co-driving with Bob Aiken. Stuck went around and took pole at Sebring by four seconds over the field. And, of course, uh, one of the members of our crew here this weekend, probably smiling when he caught a glimpse of that car, Bobby Aiken, Bob's son, is a big part of our broadcast team and the reason why we're all able to come out here to Monterey and play every year the Rolex Monterey Motorsports Reunion. Did Bobby ever raced this car? I know his dad had a 935 in Coca-Cola colors that Bobby drove. Uh, 
62. Not sure. Joe Gardner. I'm being told through the headset he did. He's dead driving. Well, I hate him even more now. Yeah. <laughs> Such a great looking car. Yeah. And another immaculate operation. This car here that Mark III were talking about earlier, how dominant it was, I would say, Bob, this car is to this category that the 91730 was to can -Am. Well, yep. Not to be negative, but a lot of people thought the, the 91730 destroyed the Can-Am series by optimizing it to a degree that no one else could quite match. And same thing was said about this car. Well, it probably scared away a lot of the other manufacturers because the bar was set so incredibly high that not only was the performance going to have to be so high, but so was your budget. Right. And the fact is that sports car racing historically has relied on privateer entries for full fields and lots of excitement. Privateers buying cars and racing them. You couldn't buy this car back in the day. And as a result, checkered flag again. Why would I race, yeah, if I have no chance of winning against these incredible cars. Congratulations. Just, yeah, just one more win for an incredible machine, and it comes at Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca. Charles Nierberg taking the victory. But we're not done here just yet. Stay with us. We're going to come right back here to Monterey. Close out the day. Day one. Rolex Monterey Motorsports for you.